Hey everyone, this is Nick, and if you thought there wasn't enough happening in the Linux world to warrant weekly Linux news videos, you are wrong, and I win, because we still have one that is packed with interesting new things. This week we have Intel revealing more detail about their upcoming dedicated Arc GPUs, we have KDE adding a lot more touch and gesture support to their desktop, and we have the first beta release of Fedora 36, which is shaping up to be an amazing release. Amazing, just like today's sponsor, which is going to let you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer, select a few configuration options, and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment, but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. Even though Linus said it's piracy. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credits and get started. So another week with yet more KDE news, as the developers make good progress on touch gestures. There's now an edge swipe gesture from the top of a touch screen that triggers the new KWIN overview, much inspired by GNOME's activities. And that gesture is now one-to-one, -one, meaning it will follow your finger as it moves, which gives a much more fluid feeling than the previous one. More gestures should also work like that in the near future, finally bringing KDE in the modern age on that front. Three more 15-minute bugs were fixed, and Dolphin gets more usability improvements, and the list of recent documents is now based on the free desktop standard, so documents will be synced with GNOME or GTK apps as well. No mention on the gesture front to know if they are Wayland only or if they work with X11 as well, so I'll have to try them out and see if they work with the touchpad as well. But that might trigger me to go back to KDE, so I'll need to be careful about that. Intel officially revealed the technical details for their new dedicated GPUs in the form of the Arc series, which follows the same naming scheme as their CPUs, with Arc 3, 5 and 7, and different models for each. These new GPUs will roll out starting with the Arc 3 and moving on to Arc 5 and 7 in the summer. All these GPUs will support Intel's take on super sampling in the form of XCSS, with that support also rolling out in the summer. And they have support for two syncing features similar to G-Sync or FreeSync, called Speed Sync for high frame rate titles, and Smooth Sync that seems lower cost in terms of resource usage and just blurs the screen tearing lines. They'll also have their own graphical utility similar to GeForce Experience, although this one might not come to Linux as manufacturers tend to only release these tools for Windows. All ARC GPUs will also have a media engine optimized for multiple codecs, including AV1, the new open codec most media giants are pushing, and that seems to have much better video quality compared to the traditional H.264. As per Linux support, I would expect Intel to keep honoring their good track record on supporting these GPUs on day one, although some gaming features will come later to Linux than on Windows, ray tracing and support for AV1 will be there on day one though. The notion of protest wear seems to establish itself, as a few open source developers update their libraries or programs to display anti-war or pro-Ukrainian messages, or even sabotage their own code by adding malicious stuff that was meant to wipe data stored in Russia and Belarus. The open source initiative published a blog post about this new trend condemning it. They state that the damage it creates is indiscriminate, and hurts regular citizens and peacemakers, as well as people involved in the conflict, and as such shouldn't be employed, at least not in the case of code sabotage. They instead encourage developers to use open source tools to inform Russian citizens of the reality of the war and the harm caused. Basically, they are saying using open source to hurt others hurts open source as well. Hey, you keep your politics out of my free and open source software, he says, not realizing that all open source and free software is inherently political. Fedora 36 is out, well, at least the public beta. This new release of one of my new favorite Linux distributions is, of course, not entirely stable, but it brings GNOME 42 as the default, with its host of improvements, especially in the looks and performance departments, 
with Libadvita finally showing its head as the core for GNOME, and a new shell and GDK theme, and official dark mode support. Of course, all other desktops are there and installable as well with their latest releases. Wayland is finally the default for everyone, including users of the NVIDIA proprietary drivers, and it brings tons of updates to the internals with kernel 5.17. The full release should be out in mid-April, unless unexpected complications arise. While I won't move to the beta because I need my work system to be airtight, I will definitely move to Fedora 36 as soon as it releases, and I'm super happy to finally try out Wayland on NVIDIA. Thunderbird, the venerable but not extremely nice looking or user-friendly email client, will receive a nice bunch of updates soon in version 102, a huge upcoming major new release. It adds a new Spaces toolbar that lets you move quickly between the various features Thunderbird offers, like email, contacts, calendars, to-dos or messages. Speaking of contacts, the address book has been completely redesigned and is now much nicer to look at and way easier to use. The app will also add cards for hyperlinks in the Mail Composer, and adding new accounts will make use of the first run wizard, so it will be easier than before. Thunderbird will also support the Matrix protocol and add a native import and export feature. Apparently, further redesigns are to be expected in the next major release, so maybe Thunderbird will finally regain my seal of approval as a user-friendly and nicely integrated email client for Linux. If you've seen my latest video on the channel about GNOME customization, you might have seen a nifty little app called Extension Manager. Well, it just had a new release, bringing some nice features to better handle the few drawbacks of GNOME extensions. Apart from a new icon that I find kinda worse than the previous one, it adds user reviews to extension pages, so you know what you're in for before jumping in. And it also lets you install unsupported extensions, if you still want to give them a shot. The app should also handle errors and out-of-date extensions better and received performance improvements. Now, speaking of extensions, there's a new interesting one if you like your UI to be low profile but still want a taskbar. App Icons taskbar puts running apps and favorites in the top panel of GNOME Shell, basically giving you dash to dock but in a lower form factor that takes up less space. It's pretty cool. If you use GNOME extensions, you should give Extension Manager a try. It's really nice. And if you don't use GNOME extensions or GNOME, check out my video in the card up top to know why it's super customizable. The release of SteamOS 3 for all computers, whenever it happens, will be more appealing now, thanks to some good news from Valve and NVIDIA. They're working to get the NVIDIA drivers working with Gamescope, the compositor used on SteamOS that implements tons of improvements specifically tailored to running games, like scaling, FSR, frame rate limiting, and performance optimizations. For now, Gamescope only works with MESA drivers that cover AMD and Intel cards, but NVIDIA developers have confirmed that they're working with Valve to make sure that their experience on NVIDIA GPUs will be up to par. That's very good news for when I make my Steam console or if I just want to dual boot SteamOS 3 on my main gaming PC. Come on, Valve, release it, SteamOS 3 for everyone. Come on, we're waiting. As I mentioned a few times, the Steam Deck Verified program has some issues. Not all games will run perfectly, even if they're marked as certified. Valve seems to be conscious of the issue, and they're gathering information on a list of games that have problems on the deck. Among these titles, there's Deathloop, Doom 2016, or Borderlands the pre-sequel. These reports can be posted on the Steam forums, as, as with all crowdsourced data, reports will vary wildly. This feedback can now also be automated right from the Steam Deck, with a new banner letting you tell them if the gameplay experience matches the label Valve has given to the game. I've seen this banner pop up a few times, and I think it's a really good idea to make sure that the labels that Valve gives stay current and that they're informed as soon as there's something not working correctly. Good call, Valve. Still on the Steam Deck, its library of certified and playable titles has now passed the 1900 games mark and might even be at over 2000 by the time you're watching this. The number of titles that Valve is reviewing is around a comfortable 30 titles per day, with the latest editions being Wolfenstein The New Order, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, NBA 2K20, Mortal Kombat 10, Oblivion, Shadow of Mordor, The Evil Within 2, Heavy Rain or Beyond Two Souls. 
The official Steam Deck library is growing well. And I say official, because just because a game hasn't been reviewed by Valve doesn't mean it's unplayable, as I've been playing a bunch of titles that haven't been reviewed yet and work just fine. Quite the little device they made there with the Steam Deck. I'm still surprised at how many games run and how well they run, given the price of the hardware and what's inside. It's great. Looks like there's a way to play Steam games with Proton on ARM CPUs using Box86. This little magic piece of software transforms x86 instructions used by AMD and Intel CPUs into ARM64 instructions used by, you guessed it, ARM CPUs. A new release of that tool now apparently lets you play games on Linux on ARM, even if these games are made for Windows and x86 CPUs. Some examples are Geometry Dash or Among Us, and compatibility reports are being added to the GitHub repo of Box86. Apparently some games even run on a Raspberry Pi 4. If it can reach an acceptable compatibility status, it could enable some nice Linux devices with ARM CPUs to be used as handheld consoles, like the Steam Deck for example. Who doesn't want to run a game that was made for another OS, for another CPU architecture, with another graphics API in mind, on a device that fills none of that criteria? It's amazing! Oh, maybe I'm just a big nerd. Wine 7.5 has been released, with the Alsa audio driver converted to the PE executable format, support for the HLSL compiler in the bundled VKD3D library, and initial support for the Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. This is a protocol used to maintain the security of a server and various network resources. Basically, it checks the validity of certificates in real time. So I guess that might be useful for network applications and maybe for some games as well. 28 bugs were also fixed, including for Minecraft for Windows 10, The Evil Within 2, Grid 2, and multiple Microsoft programs like Power Toys or the Windows Terminal. We can't have one of these weekly news videos without some wine news, right? Just like I can't have a video without telling you about today's sponsor, Slimbook. These guys are based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux laptops and desktops that they ship worldwide with all keyboard layouts. They have a huge range of devices for basically every use case. For example, the Slimbook 1, which is a very small form factor PC with a nice aluminium enclosure. It's got great design, great I.O., good performance with Ryzen CPUs, and it's also upgradable super easily. Just remove a few screws and you're done. It's a great device. So if you need something that runs Linux out of the box and you want to support Slimbook or support the channel or encourage more Linux development, then click the link in the description below and head over to Slimbook's website. They are amazing. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. If you want to help me make more of these, you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. You'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and to the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.